So highlighting the importance, furthermore, um, the US EPA has now improved their guidelines and updated, and the national recommended water quality criteria specifies that only there can be 0.27 micrograms per liter of PCP available, and only if that's the case, the water is safe for drinking. So you can see, but that allowable limit is going to increase with the less number of chlorine available in the phenol ring. So these contaminants during the production or during the operation of some other uh, chemical processes introduced to the environment through different processes like um, unplanned and improper disposal and they can be accidental spills or sometimes leaching from the landfills or it can be also most dangerous thing is that if the wood has been treated with this kind of chemicals during the evaporation process these chemicals can be emitted to the environment and polluting the air so as i mentioned before the toxicity of the chlorophenol family and the individual compounds decrease with the less number of chlorines in the phenol ring. So as you see, it's 27 milligrams per kilogram of body weight for PCP or the pentachlorophenol. And going down, phenol is still, if you remove all the chlorine from the phenol ring, it's only the phenol as the compound remaining in the environment, and phenol is still toxic and can only available as 317 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So we see that it's toxic. So we need to get rid of this if we find out that this is available in the water environment. Highlighting it more, recently the WHO has carried out a research on the CKDU affected areas in the north central province in Sri Lanka. And they have actually found out that PCP is one of the pesticides that's been detected in the uh, chronic kidney disease affected people, unfortunately. So that highlights, although I did the research in New Zealand, I still can um, relate the findings to their local context. So how do we remove it? There are so many techniques, but now that we are looking for low cost methods, one of the low cost methods is that use of different types of metals. So out of the different metals that we can use, zero valent iron or the elemental line is one of the metals that we can effectively use to remove chlorinated contaminants from water because it's available in the environment for, for low cost and also the environmental impact from using the iron is minimum compared to the other metals. So iron is becoming very popular for removing the contaminants from water. And either in the powder form or they can be in the coarse grains Depending on the type of the particle size, the efficiency can be varied as well. So depending on the time that we can allow for the treatment, we can go for either particle, smaller particles or bigger particles, and then still achieve the purpose. So what's the application of use of iron for removal of these contaminants from water? It's not popular in Sri Lanka, but it's very popular in other countries, the technique called permeable reactive barriers. So what do we basically do is that if you find a contaminated groundwater plume, you're going to dig a trench across the plume and then fill that plume with this reactive material, in this case, the iron material. So once the contaminant, the contaminated water is passing through the plume, through the, the trench, it's going, the contaminants are going to react with the reactive material, iron, and then hopefully we are going to get the treated water with either no contaminants or less contaminants from the other side, from the downstream. So this technique is becoming popular as well because it's a passive treatment. We don't need to provide any external energy. Once it's constructed with the minimum operation, we should be able to get it up and running for the designed life. And of course, it has low environmental impact. So if you're wondering about how is it really working, this material is going to remove the contaminants the basic mechanism is actually, if it is the chlorinated compound, in my case chlorophenol, phenol with chlorine attached, so what is the preferred mechanism of removal is dechlorination, removing chlorine from the phenol ring. So if that happens, then we are happy because the, then, let's say for example, if, we are, if I am focusing on pentachlorophenol, so if I see after treatment that 
it's only phenol is remaining, I can be slightly happy because compared to the toxicity of pentachlorophenol, the toxicity of phenol is going to be less. But I still need to address the, the issue of removing phenol, but that I can do at a later stage. So dechlorination is the preferred option, but unfortunately there are some other parallel processes happening. For example, incorporation is the other group of mechanisms happening where compared to dechlorination where chlorine is removing during the incorporation process, the contaminants are going to be incorporated with the different types of other compounds present. So for example, if I'm using iron, when iron is in contact with water continuously, it's going to create iron oxides in a continuous manner. And differing, di during the formation of iron oxides and precipitation of oxide, it's also going to entrap the compounds present in the water, for example, chlorophenols. So even during dechlorination or incorporation, I would expect a reduction of the specific compound in water. But if dechlorination happens, that's the preferred. And if incorporation happens, that's not preferred because even if it is incorporated and reduced from the water environment, it's still remaining with the iron oxides. So it can be released back to the water at, during the downstream flow or some other reasons. So there is, during my literature search, what I found was there is still uncertainty remaining with the mechanisms that's actually happening. And people do argue that incorporation can be a significant process, so beating the dechlorination process, so iron, use of iron is not effective at all. But also they are saying that the acidity or the physical chemical characteristics of chemical compounds can actually have a major impact on the removal of these compounds. For example, when we are increasing the number of chlorine in the phenol ring, the acidity of these compounds are going to be increased so that it's going to affect the, um, the removal process. So affinity of, for incorporation increases as the degree of chlorination decreases. So that's one of my hypotheses that I was testing. So also, although it looks very promising, the use of iron, it has its own limitations. For example, when it's in continuous contact with water, it's going to change the pH in water. So change in pH can affect the various types of iron oxides present and forming. And depending on the characteristics of the iron oxides, the reactivity of iron is going to sacrifice. For example, magnetite, I'm sure you have heard the word magnetite, the blackish color iron oxide is very reactive. That's the highest reactivity, carrying the highest reactivity among the all oxides. So that's preferred, but for example, some other oxides like magimite or lepidocrosite can actually downgrade the um, reactivity of iron. So keeping all these facts in mind, I formulated my objectives of the study as yes, the performance evaluation of iron in chlorophenol dechlorination. I also investigated the effect of degree of chlorination on chlorophenol incorporation and dechlorination when I'm using iron. So to test these um, objectives or to um, study these objectives, I used four model contaminants, pentachlorophenol, 2,3,4,6-tetrachlorophenol, 2,4,6-trichlorophenol, and 2,4-dichlorophenol. So as you see, I have chosen one from each category of each level of the compounds because they are the they are most available in the environment based on the literature search, as well as the common compounds from degradation of the pentachlorophenol as the mother compound. And I used high purity iron because um, it's easier to use high purity iron to eliminate the impurities from iron so that I can test my uh, objectives. And I also studied, I studied both dechlorination and um, incorporation. So my experimental method was using batch reactors under controlled conditions. Uh, and then I later move on to continuous flow, which I'm not presenting here. Um, analysis included uh, the uh, analysis of the parent compound that I tested, as well as all the degradation products using the gas chromatography mass spectrometer. I was paying much attention to the formation of iron oxides in different phases along the reaction period. So I could um, sort of trace their change and then relate it to the findings. So 
So these, for your interest, these are the uh, different types of pure iron oxides. So this is what I found. When I tested PCP for dechlorination using iron, as you see, the red line is the PCP concentration present in water. So as you see, the PCP concentration is reducing over time, but there is a corresponding increase of some other compounds in the water. So that actually indicated the confirmation of the PCP dechlorination in water. I also measured the chlorine concentration, so chlorine concentration was increasing in water. So at the end of the experiment period, I, I managed to get a good mass balance. The loss of PCP was able to um, balance up with the production of other products. So the, there is 96% um, mass balance and the remaining four was quite small and then they can be due to the loss during the sample handling. But look what happens when I'm starting to use different other compounds going down the line. So this is a tetrachlorophenol. I'm still getting sort of okay mass balance, which is 88%. So when tetrachlorophenol concentration goes down, there are some other compounds, for example, trichlorophenols producing in the water, accumulating in the water. Compared to 96%, 88% is little unsatisfactory, but I could still manage and say, okay, this is, I can justify this as dechlorination because there is a corresponding increase in the trichlorophenols production. But then when I go down to trichlorophenol, it was very poor mass balance, 70% only. So although there is a reduction in trichlorophenol in the water, I couldn't, be, I couldn't a, manage to detect the corresponding other degradation products present in the water so that I couldn't get a good mass balance. So the poor mass balance here was finally actually because I saw the decrease in the trichlorophenol in water, not majorly because of the dechlorination process. It was actually um, the incorporation process. And then the removal of dichlorophenol was even worse. And then there is very poor mass balance and both trichlorophenol and dichlorophenol removal was mainly because of incorporation but not dechlorination. So it was further confirmed by measuring the incorporated amount of different compounds that I tested, which shows, as you see, the uh, orange colored dotted line. Orange colored dots is the dichlorophenol, which shows the highest incorporated amount, after all. So relating it to the formation of various iron oxides, when pentachlorophenol was in contact with iron, I only detected magnetite, which is the highest reactivity iron oxide present on the surface, which is very good, and that confirmed that it's supporting the dechlorination process. But the other three compounds that I tested was only promoting the formation of some other non-reactive oxides, which was actually decreasing the reactivity of iron, and that was found as another reason for the uh, higher incorporation of these compounds compared to the pentachlorophenol. So in conclusion, testing the ZVI performance, ZVI actually can be used to dechlorinate the chlorinated contaminants, in my case chlorophenols, but it was only partial, partial chlorophenol dechlorination, not fully. And higher chlorophenol dechlorination was observed when the degree of chlorination was higher, and then with lower number of chlorine available in the phenol ring, what I observed was higher incorporation but not um, dechlorination. So that's all that I have. Thank you very much.